Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Steve Arneson of The Reinvestors and we're gonna be talking about earning versus saving. I'm so excited that Steve's here to discuss this topic with you and how we can earn a higher rate of return as real estate investors. Before we get into it with Steve, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for both Steve and myself. And without further ado, let's get into it, Steve. Uh, great to have you back. Uh, as always, you are my first and only guest that I've had on this uh, the show three times. So you must be doing something right. Uh, before we get into it, why don't you give us an intro on who you are and what you do as a real estate investor? Hey, right on, Darren. Uh, thank you for the invitation back. <laughs> That's a total privilege to be here and, and speak to uh, you and your audience. And and this is definitely just a topic that uh, I'm just fired up about. And we'll get into it in a minute. But just to give you a Cliff Notes version on, on who I am, and what we've uh, done in the past. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a company called The Reinvestors. We're based out here on the beautiful West Coast in Victoria, B.C., and we specialize on high ROI assets for investors, specifically within real estate. So income properties, flips, developments, uh, we have a new company kind of similar to a fund. Uh, and our biggest mission is, is like the, the mission statement of our company is that we want to financially educate a million people and inspire them to invest in real estate so they can live a more fulfilled life. And so a big part of that is getting on shows like, uh, like yours here uh, that is super educational and super inspiring and just delivering a, a key message. And the message that we'll be talking about through this quick episode here is just the impact that earning a higher ROI has on your financial outcome down the road and even short term, but more so down the road. Like it was Albert Einstein, I think, who said that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Mm -hmm. And so many people today, like I'll just say like average Joes and Janes are just getting funneled into uh, like traditional, traditional like investment opportunities that are, you know, get half a point here, get 2.1% here and, and so on and so forth. And the comparison between that over, you know, whether it's your RSPs, TFSA or cash savings or whatever, compared to, you know, a higher ROI, whether it's seven, 10, 16, just has such a massive, massive difference on what you'll have at the end of the day. And if you're wanting to retire early, if you're wanting to retire wealthy and live a kick-ass life, you need to find these vehicles that have a higher ROI instead of trying to penny crunch and not get your favorite Starbucks every morning or so on and so forth. It's more so about finding the right vehicle. And that's something that I'm just jacked up on and ready to dive into. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, let's, let's get in there and let's talk about it because it's something that I think a lot of people are failing at. And we, we know that we know that those statistics are there because, you know, um, I think it's 50% of the population in Canada cannot afford to retire at the age of 65. And I think that there's a big reason behind that. And one of the reasons is we are so um, systematically sort of conditioned to do what everybody else before us has done. And when you truly look at the wealthy people in the world, they've done something a little bit different. What is, why, why do you think that this is such a major problem in Canada right now? What is the thing that's holding most people back and why, why do they continue to go down the road of investing their money into, you know, a savings account or a GIC or things like that? Why, why is there, what's the barrier there? I think it's two things. The biggest thing is my parents said, insert excuse. And so like for me specifically, like looking back on my interpretational relationship with money, money is hard work. Money doesn't grow on trees, save your ass off and try to retire early. And like, if you look at, you know, the history of, of, you know, my parents, their parents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they're all like still hustling in their mid sixties. And because they did what they were told to by their parents and their parents and their parents, which is go to school, get a job a good, you know, decent job, buy a house, pay it off over 30, 40, 50 years, even like, cause you mm. typically like buy it, sell it, move into the next one, refinance. Cause you want to go travel or do renovations or et cetera, et cetera. And then maybe by the time you're 70, you have enough equity in your home to retire on. And then you sacrifice everything that you've built on uh, by selling your house or refinancing and then like doing a backwards mortgage or whatever it's called to live off of that. Well, that didn't work for my parents, their grandparents or their grandparents. So something's wrong. And biggest, the biggest thing about it is just the awareness of what else is out there. Mm. And so coming back to that, like mission statement is we want to financially educate a million people. A big part of that is just saying, Hey, what are some alternatives to institutional investments? I think that's a great point, Stephen. I think there's another factor there too, that, you know, you, you would probably agree with me on. And that is 
when people hear um, higher rates of return, when, when, we're, when I'm talking to investors about our projects and I say, um, if, they're, if they're savvy investors, they get it. But if they're not so conditioned to hearing these kinds of returns, if I said to somebody, they're going to make 17 to 22% annualized return, what, what's their immediate reaction? Scam. Yeah. <laughs> or it's risky. <laughs> right, right. Because yeah. we equate uh, return to risk, right? Which is another like institutional thing that, that uh, you know, uh, we've been taught over the years. What, what's your experience with, with talking to people about, you know, what you do in real estate investor, uh, real estate investing, because you're, you're significantly younger and, and clearly better looking than I am. So like, what is it that your friends are saying? And why is it that they're maybe hesitant to get into real estate investing? I don't know about the, uh, the good looking portion, but I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I got the fresh haircut, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the biggest thing out here is very similar. Like you start talking about, I think when it's single digits, people get it right. You can, you can kind of see that, you know, it's been heard up before, you know, maybe you got lucky in the stock market, you know, especially if you invested on March 17th in 2020, because everything has just gone up like 80% since then. Mm-hmm. Um, when you start getting into that double digit pieces, like the 10 to 12, I think a lot of people are, are starting to be like, okay, that sounds really good, but what's the catch? And then when you start talking about like, you know, the 14s, the 16s, the 18s, you know, in a lot of the, devel- the development projects that we do, how we structure it is very different to an institutional piece where it's actually a share of profits and not just a, le- a private lend. We're, we're offering like our, our projected returns are like 20% plus. And when, like you said, when people are sophisticated and they know real estate, they get it. They see how it all ties together. But if you just go up to, you know, uh, somebody on the side of the road and like, and you, and you mentioned, hey, do you want to get 20% returns? They'll say, yeah, are you putting it on number 17, black or red, mm-hmm. right? And, and they don't quite have that sophisticated aspect of things. And the biggest part, a piece of that is because it's not taught in schools. Like we, you and I have a lot of close friends whose biggest mission is just to disrupt the education process because yeah. like I graduated high school in 2005 and at none of that time was I taught about credit or how to use credit cards or like compound interest or anything along those lines. And instead I got taught, you know, A plus B equals C somehow. And I don't do any of that. I left the architect figure that one out for me, but um <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a challenge that, you know, uh, shows like yours are, are, you know, starting to get there. And I think more and more people are, are starting to be aware of, of, hey, this needs to change and it needs to start at a young age. You, you built out a spreadsheet and I, I want you to share it with everybody because it's really cool. It talks about the differences and shows the differences between, um, you know, if we're earning a higher rate of return and we're going to talk about what kinds of things we can earn higher rates of return in after we walk through this, but I want you to just kind of take people through it and, and show them how it works and what you've created here. In, in the spreadsheet, just as an you know, instructions pieces, you know, just change the yellow boxes. So uh, all you have to do is change the starting investment amount, how much you're saving or trying to save per month, and, you know, how many years until you want to retire, whether that's 25 uh, that's as far as it goes. So don't go anything higher than that. Um, <laughs> uh, or, or five or, or you should be setting higher goals if it's yeah. 25 years. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And then in scenario one, uh, you're getting a 7% ROI. Now this is where I, I want to connect it to a personal story. And so over the years, you know, uh, we've become more financially aware uh, of, you know, ROIs and fees and, and, you know, vehicles to invest into. And I've been dragging my parents along with me and Mm -hmm. they are, you know, in their sixties and stubborn like me. And uh, so it takes a little bit of time for them to really, you know, understand something and and accept change. And Mm -hmm. so uh, for them, I was talking to them like, and one of them were, was really excited because they found a way to uh, cut luxuries out of their life to save an extra $400 a month to invest into their RSPs. Mm-hmm. And part of me was like, yes, that sounds awesome, but damn, that sucks because I want to see them live their best life and saving an extra $400 a month, cutting out their Starbucks, you know, selling one of their cars. So they downsize just to one car um, and so on and so forth. It's, it's limiting their lifestyle. And for me, it sucks because I want them to live their best life. And obviously they do too. So mm-hmm. I started thinking, is it, better for them to save $400 a month or $1,000 a month or whatever that looks like and, and get what they've been getting, which is about 7% um, 
pre-fees in their portfolio? Mm -hmm. Or is it better just to find a better vehicle to invest into without having to sacrifice the extra savings? So I have scenario one, which is you or, or you know, in this particular case, my family saving more and earning what they've been earning over the last, I'll say, decade uh, and contributing the eight, uh, sorry, the, the $4,800 uh, a year and earning interest on that. Scenario two is you're not contributing anything. You're just the same start point of 100000 All you're doing is, is uh, earning more annually. And then scenario three, I have it hidden right now because it's a bit of a sneak peek, uh, but scenario three combines both. You save and you earn higher and you get a way better outcome. Mm. So just to walk through real quick on scenario one, after five years, you start off with 100,000, you're contributing you know, 4,800 uh, a year, you're earning interest on that contributions. You know, it's a $7,000 plus interest that you're earning. Uh, and after five years, you got just shy of 170,000. Now take scenario two, comparing apples to apples, you're saving yourself, you're keeping $400 a month in your pocket, all you're doing is you're earning a little bit higher ROI and there's still a $10,000 better outcome after five years. Now, after 10 years, it's $57,000 better. After 20 years, it's almost half a million dollars better. And after 25 years, it's a million dollars better. Mm. All you're doing, you're not trying to sacrifice more out of your daily lifestyle. All you're doing is just trying to find better vehicles to invest into. So if you wanted to change that and really have fun with it, you can go like maybe you're planning to retire in 11 years. This number is going to change right here. So from the million dollars difference, it's still a $73,000 better. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to take that back to just a 20, maybe you're a little bit down, down the line, it's still half a million dollars better. What if you're trying to save $1,000 a month? It's still $141,000 better. What if you're saving $1,000 a month, you're earning 7% ROI, but you can find something that's 16% ROI. And then just real quick, I'll show you the, the 3% one, or sorry, the, the scenario three. I'll mm -hmm. drop that back down to 400 bucks, 25 years, seven, I'll go this to 12 and a half. So going back to like scenario two is a million dollars better. Scenario three, where you're, you're still saving this because you can, um, and you're earning the 12 and a half, it's almost $2 million better over the long haul. Well, I think when people see numbers like that, um, it, it's pretty telling, right? And I think that the biggest hurdle for most people is they say, absolutely great. I'm in Steve, hundred percent. Now, what do I do? They call you. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the vehicles that, you know, you and I are big, uh, obviously big proponents of real estate investing, but what are some of the things, um, where you're seeing people being able to earn 12 and a half, you know, to 16% return with keeping that risk for, you know, um, profile in check for sure. Because I think you can earn much higher rates of return, but then your risk uh, goes off the charts. So what, what do you suggest in, in this, uh, in this space? I actually want to go backwards here yeah. and say that risk. Yes. I, mean, I think there's a lot of ways to secure your risk within real estate as, as a lot of your viewers already know. Uh, I got an email the other day that I want to share with you guys, and it's from, uh, um, what do you call it? A uh, financial institution out here on the West Coast. I don't know if you guys have it out East, uh, but here it is. I'll, I'll zoom in for a second. Uh, this is the part that really freaks you out. I don't know if you can see that, but it says, can, yeah. you can. So it reads that for one year, you can get 0.5% ROI in your RRSPs and your TFSAs. Dare to dream. Do <laughs> right. So for for people that for people that don't know the rule of seventy two, uh, the rule of seventy two says you take seventy two, you divide it by your fixed rate of interest, right? And that tells you how how long it takes you to double your money. So it's only going to take you one hundred and forty four years to double your money. So you put in a hundred grand now, and and one hundred and forty four years from now, you'll get two hundred thousand dollars back. So, the point I wanted to really mention though is something like that, even on a really low interest rate it's still not guaranteed. There's nothing yeah. in that email that says it's guaranteed. So right. it doesn't matter what kind of investment you're doing, whether you're getting 0.5%, 2%, 7%, 20%, none of it is guaranteed. Mm. The best thing you can do though, is find stuff that has secured assets to it. I do, like I'm starting to play around a little more in the stock market as well. You know, I think the average S&P or, or whatever the other ones are out there, like as a whole, it's like somewhere between six and 9%. So you cut the difference, call it seven and a half percent average, right? You're earning 7% 
uh, just in principle that you're paying down by owning a home or by mm-hmm. holding holding mortgages. So uh, a couple of different vehicles that you can find those, you know, double digit returns on. Private lending is a great one. I prefer to be uh, or recommend people to actually be on title, whether that's a, a first or a second position. Even in the second position, I still believe that it's a secure investment. And the reason I do is because the, uh, the second mortgages that I would invest into would still have a, a great loan to value. I'm not pushing that 80 or 90% mark. I'm pushing that like 65, 73% mark. You can get into the development space as well, which we're heavy on, especially here in the West Coast, because supply is just, it's not keeping up with population. So there's going to be demand for it for years and years and years. And we're on that like inside edge trying to create inventory. And how we do it is actually we share our whole profit pool of the development with our investors. And so that's how we can kind of create a higher ROI. And we're talking like 18, 20, 24%. And it's secured by the dirt, by the earth and by the development itself and the revenues. And obviously like you always want to work with people who are much conservative. So we use inner performers, um, cut like higher than expected costs and lower than expected revenues so we can over deliver. Um, and then we also have, you know, uh, there's, there's places out there, uh, companies, funds and stuff that you can get involved in that uh, are also secured by, by real estate. REITs could be one, parametric is another that you can start earning that, you know, 12, 16, 18, 20% return on as well. And it's secured by the real estate itself. Or for people that aren't familiar with it, what is a REIT and what is parametric? Uh, so a REIT is a real estate investment trust. And so they, uh, you know, uh, mix or, or something similar as well, but on the mortgage side of things, you're typically getting the five to 6% side uh, REITs. You're, you're banking on some of that appreciation and the principal and some of the cash flow. And so uh, a big REIT would own, you know, millions, if not billions of dollars worth of real estate. And it could be commercial, it could be residential, a mix of, et cetera. And it's not a whole lot different than a stock. You're buying a share in a company that owns a ton of real estate. And that's what parametric is. We're the same thing. Uh, we're not a fund. Uh, but we're a company that you can buy a share in and you capitalize on the gains that, that, uh, that we create from all the assets that we own under our portfolio. So specifically what we're doing is the burn model, which I think that you've covered in, in another episode as well. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of a burn model is you get to repeat your, your investment. So you take hundred thousand dollars, for example, you buy a property, you put $50,000 into it. It's now worth say $200,000. You get to refinance a bunch of your money back out and go do it again and again and again. And the beauty about working with a company is that we get to do it on scale. So you as an individual, you're kind of capped because a lot of times you're buying um, with your personal name and you can only really qualify for five properties now. If that, a lot of lenders are getting a lot tighter on that and you're only limited to two or three. With a company, because we get um, like portfolio lending, we get to capitalize on refinancing the entire portfolio at one time. So we've got you know, 20 properties under your belt. You get to uh, capitalize on the, the cash flow that's giving you cash in the bank the principal that you're earning every single month and the forced appreciation and natural appreciation that's taking place over multiple properties, refinancing and going and doing and replicating over and over and over again. And for, for um, folks that are getting started, Steve, what um, the, the question comes up, like how much money do I need to have and uh, how long do I need to keep that money invested in, you know, a development project, for instance, versus private lending versus, uh, you know, maybe a REIT or, or parametric, something like that. How do those differ? Yeah, so you can find opportunities that are still going to give you a good ROI, 10% plus, that are three months. Like on the private lending side of things, oftentimes people are um, in over their head on a renovation and have a lot of equity in their home and just need a little bit of extra help, uh, 20,000, 40,000, wherever that is, for a short amount of time to complete the renovation and get the, the property sold or refinanced. So you can find something three to six months fairly easily. And that's sort of like, early double digits on the opposite spectrum of things uh the development side of things is two years to five years sometimes even longer we're specifically looking for products that are like permit ready and so you eliminate a lot of that initial risk of getting off the ground um and so that's kind of like that two to three year time frame and then you can find stuff in between so the parametric one is about two to three years and you know depending on if it's a private land or if it's a development or if it's you know a REIT or a fund uh it ranges on the low side from 10 to twenty thousand, 
to the high side of you know hundred thousand dollars plus. So there's really a vehicle for everybody out there. It's a co combination of all those things. You know, we talked about earlier. It's the rate of return. It's you know working with trusted people. It's securing your money against something, and then also. Uh, for me, you know, really getting involved in the real estate market and staying diversified has been the key to success for, for most of the wealthy people that I know. And one of the other factors that's important is that we take control of our money and we take control of our future, right? I think so many people put it in the hands of somebody else, expecting them to make them wealthy. Um, and it often, you know, doesn't, doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big, big point of it. Like spend the extra couple of minutes, you know, maybe it's a podcast a day, maybe it's, you know, a book a month or whatever to really start to understand the financial position that you're in and how money works and how real estate works, how the fee structure, if you already have an investment advisor, ask him or her specifically what that fee structure is and what the end of the day net ROI that you're receiving every year is. That's the number that you want to know. Absolutely. Steve, thanks so much for walking us through uh, the spreadsheet that you have there. People can, I'm going to leave it in the description below. I'm also going to leave your contact information if people want to reach out to you uh, or Randy of the reinvestors. Uh, you guys are always available, always willing to talk with investors, um, you know, just about what you're doing and your projects. Um, I, uh, I, I can't say enough about you guys and, and what you're doing on the West Coast. Uh, and we're so, so excited about our group, the Synergy Mastermind, which has been a which has been a great group to be a part of. I'll leave that information in the description below too, because if you were interested in being part of our Synergy group in year two, uh, that's coming up in September. You can uh, go through the application process. If you guys enjoyed the session with Steve, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and feel free to leave comments and questions below for both Steve and myself. We'd love to hear the rate of return you're earning on your money when you'd like to retire and, and how you're planning to get there. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website website at darrenburrows.com. With that, I'll say, Steve, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to join us. Talk about how we can earn a higher rate of return, the vehicles that we can use to do that, and what that, how, how, how massive of an outcome that can have on our, on our wealth as we, as we earn in the future. Um, I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey, but I really don't need to wish you success. You guys are just creating it over and over again there. But uh, thanks again for being, uh, being a part of uh, today's session. Thanks again for having me, man. Uh, looking forward to possibly being here again. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> now, now you're like a monthly staple. <laughs> thanks, buddy. Uh, thanks. I appreciate the time.